act like a bad cold. <laughs> when I think of the quintessential finisher of whatever they began, they finished it well in the name of Jesus, I think of the Apostle Paul. And we're going to look at just a little line that identifies him tonight rather than the big swath that we have done with some of these other character studies. I'd like to admit right up front, maybe this is a confession, I find myself drawn to this feisty, combative, imperfect, grace-filled leader. I can't explain all the reasons why I'm drawn to him, but I am. And I actually have two very vivid, very concrete impressions before we get into this profile study of the great Apostle Paul. My first impression that I have, believe it or not, is that of Mike Baker. When I first met Mike 20 plus years ago on a mission trip to the Dominican Republic, I was struck, even though he was quite young, I was struck by his all-in, no halfway a posture, his life of ministry. He was just ignited. He's kept that alive over these years. So I had this picture of Mike Baker in some way being a, a, a profile of what I think of when I think of the Apostle Paul. The, the second one is actually a, a historical document. I'm going to read a line for you. It comes from a, a document that probably dates to about 160 A.D. So mid to late 2nd century A.D., there is a writing called the Acts, A-C-T-S, the Acts of Thecla and Paul. And in that document, there's this description of the apostle. It reads this way. A man of little stature, balding, crooked in the legs, of good state of body, with eyebrows joining, nose somewhat hooked, full of grace. Sometimes he appeared like a man and sometimes he had the face of an angel. Now I have talked about that before. When I read those words and I conjure up what he might have looked like based on that description, of course I see Yoda of Star Wars. <laughs> Needless to say, I love Paul. And I don't know if there's a better line than the one I want to read right now in Acts chapter 20, beginning and alone in verse 24. Acts 20, 24. It reads this way in my Bible. Paul is speaking these words. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Now let me set it up and then we'll take this little verse apart. The context here is about, don't hold me on this, it's about 58 AD. It's late 50s. Uh, Paul is urgent. You can actually pick up some of the urgency that he has in his heart down in verse 16 where it says, Luke, Luke makes this statement, this observation about Paul, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. So passionate Paul, combative Paul, zealous Paul is in a hurry to get to Jerusalem, but he has on his heart the Ephesian elders. And so instead of detouring, Moving away from the Aegean Sea, he's down on a beach, a place called Miletus. He calls them to come to him. This may very well be, as far as I can tell in reading the book of Acts, this may very well be the first exclusive leadership conference in the history of the church. He calls these guys, we don't know how many, but he calls these Ephesian elders because he's in a hurry and he's asking them to hear his heart. He is sounding like he has been persuaded by the Holy Spirit, perhaps by his own understanding or reports that his life will not live, will not go on much further. So he makes this extraordinary statement. 
I'd like to just throw out my big idea and then unpack this verse. Here's what I want to talk about with you tonight. Finishing well calls for selflessness. Finishing well calls for selflessness. Now, it's going to sound again like here J.K. goes again on another venture into describing three ingredients, but that's how this passage worked itself out. There are three finishing well metaphors in this verse, and I want to unpack them with you. Here's the first one. Look at the first line in verse 24 again. I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. The first metaphor, obviously, is the metaphor of an accountant. I, look at it again, I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. He thought of himself, he did what I would call divine math. And as he does the divine math, he comes to the conclusion that his life really isn't that significant. What really matters is the ongoing influence of the kingdom in the world through all the people that he has discipled. I wanted you to notice these two descriptive terms that he uses of himself. I do not account my life first of any value. Do you see that little word value? We have talked about this word before, and you're going to scratch your head and say, what in the world? Why would Dr. Luke insert this in Paul's little testimony about his life. It's a word that you're familiar with. It's the Greek word logos. But it's translated here value. Logos, L-O-G-O-S. It's that word that usually gets translated word, W-O-R-D, or reason, like in John, the Gospel of John, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning was the logos, was the word. It's the word that actually shows up in Paul's declaration here with translated with that word value. What what I think he means, what he's trying to say here is that something, uh, there's something about his own assessment of his life that is not worth thinking about. My life is not worthy of, we might translate it this way, my life is not worthy of mentioning. If he was here, he might say, what I meant to say was, my life truly is valueless. Now notice the second word he uses to describe this accountant metaphor. He says in this verse, nor as precious, that's a word I want you to notice, nor as precious to myself. That word literally carries the idea of something costly, something expensive, something Prized. We could even translate it this way, something even honored. It's used of, it's used by Dr. Luke in some chapters back, back in Acts chapter 5, when, when Luke talks about Paul's mentor, a, a Jewish scholar by the name of Gamaliel. It's used of him in Acts chapter 4, verse 34. If Paul were here, he might say this about this accountant metaphor, what he meant when he assessed his own life. He might say, my life is precious less. So I've been churning this around in my, my own mind. Paul is describing what I hope would be described of me, what I would hope would be described of you, that you're learning the art of dying to yourself, of releasing your ego, of surrendering your agenda of flushing your life down the spiritual toilet. Sorry about the image. Finishing well calls for selflessness. I got thinking about something that I remembered. A number of years ago, Sue and I read through, I think this was the first time that Sue had read Eugene Peterson. Eugene Peterson the uh, scholar, the one who put together the Bible that many of you have enjoyed reading, the message. He's written a whole host of other books, and I think I've read most of them. But a number of years ago, he wrote a book called The Contemplative Pastor. Lousy title, but Sue and I read it together. And there's a line in that particular book that I jotted in my Bible over this text. This is what Peterson said. He said, I'm quoting him, 
The kingdom of self is heavily defended territory. So think of, think of Jesus' words. Think of Luke 9.23. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, herself, and take up their cross daily and follow me. Lay that over Paul's statement. Metaphor number one, Paul says, I'm an accountant and I have done the divine math. In the back of my Bible, I think I've talked about this here and there, and so maybe I'm repeating myself. I keep things that strike me as genuine prayers. And in the very back, the last prayer that I have jotted in my Bible is actually from a, we might call her a mother superior, an anonymous abbess, or a, a nun, a Catholic nun who oversaw an entire abbot of sisters. And she prays this prayer, and I love it so much I transfer it from one Bible to the next when I wear that one out and I go on to another one. This is her prayer. Lord, thou knowest better than I know myself that I'm growing older and will someday be old. Keep me from getting talkative and particularly from the fatal habit of thinking I must say something on every subject and every occasion. Release me from craving to try to straighten out everyone's affairs. Keep my mind from the endless recital of details. Give me wings to get to the point. I ask for grace enough to listen to the tales of other people's pains. Help me to endure them with patience. But seal my lips on my own aches and pains. They're increasing, and my love of rehearsing them is becoming sweeter as the years go by. Teach me the glorious lesson that occasionally it is possible that I might be mistaken. Keep me reasonably sweet. I do not want to be a saint. Some of them are so hard to live with. But a sour old person is one of the crowning works of the devil. Make me thoughtful but not moody, helpful but not bossy. With my vast store of wisdom, it seems a pity not to use it all. But thou knowest, Lord, that I want a few friends with me at the end. Amen. I love that. Metaphor one, the accountant. Devotional question, have we done the divine math? Here's the second metaphor. You probably picked up on it rather quickly right in the middle of the verse. Paul says, if only I may finish my course. If only I may finish my course. Obviously, that's athletic or what I'm going to call runner imagery. Athletic imagery. Paul declares his intentional Heart. He's saying, if I could translate it for us, he's saying, I will not quit. Now, his writings, and I had to whittle this down to a manageable size, his writings, at least 13 letters, depending if you throw Hebrews into that, 14 letters of the 27 books that we have in the New Testament are clearly his. I had to just decide What do I read and what do I not read in terms of this runner metaphor? So I picked two. One I think you know really well. This one may not be quite as familiar, the first one, but some of you will recognize it. I'm in 1 Corinthians, and I'm going to read just the last part of chapter 9. 1 Corinthians 9, where he uses the very same imagery of a runner to describe the challenge of finishing well. This is what he says. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. He's using the very same imagery, the very same language that he does in that declaration in Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Now this one I think you know, and I think many of you have put it to memory. I'm in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, actually the very same Greek vocabulary occurs in this line that occurs in the passage we're talking about tonight. Listen to this, 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7, I have fought the good fight, here it is now, I have finished 
the race. I have kept the faith. And then he breaks into almost doxology-like wording. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. And he goes on to explain all of that. Second metaphor, runner. Paul has committed himself to finish, not just to stumble across the line, but to run passionately across the line. Lots of other verses speak to this. It's funny when you're studying something and things are coming into your mind, you're doing your word studies, you're noticing sentences, you're comparing passages with passages, and you're looking at Paul's life in general and I found myself thinking back to a time when my family and I were living in northern Indiana. My memory is that I was in the seventh grade, and in order to play basketball in Indiana, you had to go out for track or cross country. And I've told you this before, I've always been the husky guy, not that a friend of mine likes saying it this way, I'll never be mistaken for a Kenyan runner. So I decided, okay, I'll yield to this rule and I'll, I'll run cross country. Our coach's name, I can't make this up, our coach's name was Steele, Coach Steele, Coach Lonnie Steele. And we had run our little fannies off as 7th and 8th graders and we were in the final meet, the county cross country championship and he had given us instruction on what we were to do and not do and he had made a a, a, a really strong point looking right at me to, to say stay with our best runners so we were running my memory is it was a three mile run we had run through the countryside of that uh, rural area in northern Indiana and we were coming down to the end and and I had noticed how the the chute, the area that closes in, uh, where you get down to the finishing line, it got narrower and narrower. And I, because of Coach Steele's words to me, I had made up my mind that I I was going to finish as strongly as I could. But a kid from another neighboring school was matching me stride for stride. Now, you'll think less of me, but you have to remember, this is is (laughs) pre-Jesus. I haven't met him yet. And so he, the other runner, says something to me, derogatory, and in kind, I say something derogatory. It's amazing how when you don't think you have any more air, any more oxygen, that you can find it when you are a feisty and you're combative. And so we're exchanging ridicules, and he swore, and I swore, but what he doesn't know is, I have made up my mind. And we got down to that little corridor where only one runner can get in. And there were these two steel posts. And I decided, I didn't care if I ran into that. I was going to... And he quit. He just quit. He got behind me. And And I didn't get first. I didn't get second. I didn't get third. I didn't get fourth. I didn't get fifth. I was the eighth runner to finish. But Coach Steele was jumping up and down like a lunatic. That here was somebody who really listened to what he had said. That's what I hear in Paul. His words are declaring, I'm finishing, I want you to finish. He's saying this, remember, to these leaders, these Ephesian elders, calling them to this metaphor, be a runner, finish strongly. Let me get to the third metaphor. This one's not so obvious, but I think it's clearly here. Last part of the verse, verse 24 And the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. What he's fundamentally talking about is the metaphor of being a steward. A manager of all that God has entrusted to him. Here he calls it the gospel of the grace of God. Now to understand what he's saying, that word received is a really important word. Because it rewinds, it takes us all the way back to Acts chapter 9. If you know the book of Acts, you know that on three occasions, Dr. Luke tells the story of Paul's conversion. In Acts 9 is the first story, the Damascus Road experience, the blinding light, the encounter with Jesus, the surrendering, the calling of Ananias to lay hands on Paul, baptize Paul, his conversion. He repeats that in chapter 22 and in chapter 26. When Paul uses this word received, I think he's thinking back to his conversion story because in Acts chapter 9, there's this little interesting term that gets used. 
God is explaining this to Ananias, who's reluctant. You can imagine why. Murderous, angry, hate-filled Paul is now supposedly a Jesus follower. Ananias said, I don't know about this, God. I don't know if this is a good idea. And God says, here's the word. He says, he is, Acts 9 verse 15, he is my chosen vessel. Your translation may chosen may say chosen instrument. I had a student at Lincoln several years ago who, uh, shall we be kind, who didn't do his thorough study of that metaphor. I had an assignment where they had to do metaphor work, and he saw the word instrument. He was a worship studies major. My wife is going to shoot me for saying this. He was a worship studies major, and he saw the word instrument, and he assumed that Paul must have been talking about that his life is like a drummer, his life is like a trumpet, his life is like a, I don't know, a guitar, some kind of instrument, except that's not the wording here. I had to give him an F. The wording here is a kitchen utensil. Uh, We might say a, a bronze plate, a clay pot. Actually, this is interesting, over in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he uses this very language, this pot of clay language in 2 Corinthians to describe who we are, that we have in these jars of clay, these same word, these instruments, these vessels, the living presence of Jesus Christ. So as Paul is declaring this to the Ephesian elders that he's received something, I think he's thinking about his life, that he is a a pan in God's kitchen. He's a dish in God's kitchen. He's a pot of clay in God's kitchen. And if you know your Bible, you know that in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, he declares that the only thing asked of a steward is that that steward be found, can you say it out loud, be found faithful. I asked my mother this one time. It's been on my mind all week. I asked my mother one time why she didn't leave my father. Mom, he's difficult to live with. You've had a long and hard life. Why do you stay with him? And I could tell after I asked it that that was a really stupid question. Her comment was because I made a promise. In Acts chapter 9, a promise is made, and Paul accepts that promise. Fast forward years into ministry, we arrive in Acts chapter 20, and he declares it again, that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify, to speak up, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about the gospel of the grace of God. So here's the question. Here's the devotional question. Am I stewarding whatever I have left Am I stewarding all of that faithfully? Now, I can't read this. I don't know about you. I can't read this. I can't hear it. I can't reflect on it. And not think about 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. It's Paul's parallel. It's his description of Jesus, how Jesus finishes well. In that passage, in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, Paul makes this statement. It's in the context of a cross-cultural offering. He's speaking of Jesus, and he says of Jesus, though he was rich, he became poor so that we who were poor might become rich. Finishing well calls for selflessness. So I called a friend. His name is Mark Scott. He teaches down at Ozark. We've been friends since we were seminarians. We exchanged pulpits. We've traveled together, cried together, laughed together, taught together. He actually drives up here uh, every year and teaches in our master's program. And I remembered, when I was studying this, I remembered Mark saying something to me that his, some of us have these, he told me once that his life verse... His signature verse was Acts chapter 20, 
verse 24. When I asked him why, we were texting back and forth this week. I was asking him some specific questions. I said, why did you choose that verse? He said when he was a freshman in Bible college, he was studying at Ozark, he took a class simply called Acts. And as they were methodically working their way through the book of Acts, they came to this very verse, Acts 20, 24. And Mark said he was so struck by this verse, how it explains the start of the Christian life. The start of the Christian life means you got to die to yourself. He saw that in this verse. He saw the end of life in this verse, that if you want to be a Jesus follower, you commit yourself like Paul and you, you desire to finish well. And then he said he saw the calling the vocational calling on his life in this last line about bearing testimony to the gospel and the grace of God that was in his life. And so he wrote it on a three-by-five card. He wrote this verse down on a three-by-five card. On graduation, he took that class when he was a freshman. On graduation day, his senior year, he had the three-by-five card. He tucked it under his graduation cap, his skull cap, and he walked down the aisle. He got his diploma, and after it was over, he said to himself, now what? What do I do now? He took that card, he took a little pen, and he poked it up on the wall of his study where he could see it. Somebody in the church thought that looked kind of tacky, so they took it down They framed it, put a border on it, really did it well, and gave it back to Mark. And from that day forward, he said he looks at it every single day. When he was done telling me all that, my response was, man, does it show in your life. An accountant, a runner, a steward. Finishing well calls for a selflessness. I'm simply inviting you to do what I've committed myself to do, to finish as well as I can.